Once upon a time, there was a Chinese farmer whose horse ran away. And all the neighbors came around to commiserate that evening. So sorry to hear your horses run away. That's too bad. And he said, maybe. The next day, the horse came back, bringing seven wild horses with it. And everybody came around in the evening and said, oh, isn't that lucky? What a great turn of events. You've now got eight horses. And he said, maybe. The next day, his son uh, tried to break one of these horses and ride it and was thrown and broke his leg. And they all said, oh, dear, that's too bad. And he said, maybe. The following day, the conscription officers came around to recruit to force people into the army, and they rejected his son because he had a broken leg. And all the people came around and said, isn't that great? And he said, maybe. <laughs> you see, that is the attitude of not thinking of things in terms of gain or loss, advantage or disadvantage, because you don't really know. The fact that you might get a letter from a law office tomorrow uh, saying that some distant relative of yours had left you a million dollars uh, might be something you would feel very, very happy about. But the disasters that it could lead to are unbelievable. Try to live in such a way that nothing is either an advantage or a disadvantage. You never really know whether something is fortune or misfortune. But we only know the momentary changes and as it alters our sense of hope about things. What is very difficult for us to see is that solids are all of a piece with spaces. Now here comes the thing, you see. Take a situation in which we say of a given figure ground relationship that the black is the thing the black letter on the white page. We say, yes, it's the black letter that's important. That's the thing. But supposing it's a white letter on a black page. Still, we say the letter's the thing. That's important. All right. So we say we look out in the sky at night and we see the stars and the planets. We say that's what's there. That's the thing. Around them is darkness and nothingness. Corresponding to the area of the magnetic tape which isn't magnetized, which delivers no message and therefore the message is zero. But that, you see, does deliver a message. Absence speaks. Nothingness is important. But we are brought up, we are so brainwashed, we are so bamboozled, we are so hypnotized that we don't know that. That's the whole trick that we've played on ourselves. 
We don't know that nothing is something. And it's important. The usefulness of a vessel is not so much in the clay surround, but in the empty space in which something can be carried. The usefulness of a window is not so much in the frame as in the empty space through which light can be seen. The space is, after all, not nothing. When we don't recognize that side of life, people can play all kinds of tricks on us. The main trick is, I can scare you with death. You won't be, see? I can remove you. Wow. You're going to get removed anyway one of these days, and you just won't be. Won't that be awful? That'll be just terrible. You know, supposing you won't be, there'll be nobody to realize how terrible it is. <laughs> but this is the thing, that this is one of the great tricks of life, and you have to be watching for this, as people use it, they, because they've all been taught to use it. It's really the fall of man, was not to recognize the other side. People are afraid of the negative one. Don't be negative. The power of positive thinking. That's all nonsense. The negative is the source of the positive. It isn't easy for a human being, the way we've been trained, 
to notice that you can't have one without the other. Because our attention has difficulty in seeing both sides at once. You know that Gestalt image where you get two faces in profile and they are drawn as black silhouette. So you get two faces in profile about to kiss. But then look again and you notice the white ground between them and it is a cup like a chalice. What have we got here? Kissing faces or chalice? People have difficulty in seeing both together. You must have one or the other. Either will do, but make your choice. what we are trying to do. We are trying to have yang without yin. We are trying to arrange a life game in which there is winning without losing. Now how can you arrange such a state of affairs? A game in which everybody wins would end up, as W.S. Gilbert put it, when everybody is somebody then no one's anybody. If we are all equally happy, it is impossible to know that we are happy. We would not recognize saints unless there were sinners, or sages unless there were fools. And there is no way out of that dilemma. Difference is identity, identity is difference. You are both what you do and what happens to you. So that you have a little game in which you play that what happens to you, that you're not responsible for. That's not you, see? You're only responsible for this side of it. And then you can compete with the other side. What it's like is this. Get two knitting pins, one in each hand, and have a fencing match with yourself. And really sincerely try to stick the other hand. But that other hand must really sincerely be trying to stick the first one and also to defend itself. It's like playing chess with yourself. You see? 
Now it won't work, you'll come to a sort of standstill unless you decide for your right hand that that's the one that's really going to win. Well, then you've broken the rule of the game, you see. Well, that's what we do. The realization that you can't do anything about it, and equivalently that you can't do nothing about it, comes of course the awakening that the reason for that is there is no you separate from you. In other words, when you try to control your thoughts or control your feelings, there is no difference between the thoughts and the controller. Because what you call the thinker is simply your thought of yourself. The thinker is a thought among thoughts, and the feeler is a feeling among feelings. And trying to control thoughts with thoughts is like trying to bite your own teeth. So you found that out. Well, then the other side of the picture is, of course, that if you do find that out, you discover that the project of controlling yourself was unnecessary because you were yourself a Buddha from the very beginning. That's what the Upanishads mean when they say quite simply, Tattvamasi. You're it, you're it, you're it. If you feel at this moment that an increase in income would solve your problems and you got an increase in income, this would give you a pleasant feeling for a few weeks. But then, as you well know, if that's ever happened to you, the feeling wears off. And you may stop worrying about paying your debts and start worrying about whether you will get sick. There is always something to worry about. And if you are very rich indeed, you've still got the anxiety about sickness and death and also anxieties about revolution and about whether the internal revenue service will take it all away from you or catch you for cheating on your taxes or put you in prison for no good reason. Now there is always this worry and so you realize that the problem of life does not really consist in your external circumstances because you worry whatever they are. The problem consists in rather in what you call your mind.
You suffer from yourselves. None else compels. None other holds you that you live and die and whir upon the wheel and hug and kiss its spokes of agony, its tire of tears, its name of nothingness. It's you. You do it. Westerners, when they hear about Buddhism and Taoism and this sort of thing, they interpret it one-sidedly as passivity and don't see that what sometimes looks like passivity is cleverness. You, as businessmen often know, if you leave letters unanswered for a month, when you return them, many of them have already answered themselves. And sometimes when you sit and do nothing, you uh, avoid making very serious mistakes, which would have arisen if you had acted prematurely, if you had done something about it. This tendency to look inactive and to go in the direction in the arts of a kind of primitivity, which we know in the word shibui, is a certain kind of sophisticated primitivity. Listen to these contradictions, these paradoxes. The pr sophisticated primitivity, controlled accident, where you see man and nature are really collaborating. Man as the controller, the reasoner, the logical <coughs> being, and yet at the same time not ruining life by making it all logic and all control. To have logic and to have control that is to say, in short, to have order, you have to have randomness. Because where there is no randomness, order cannot manifest itself. The basic feeling of sabi is loneliness. One of the great 
paintings that illustrate Sabi is the lonely crow on a tree branch. It is the feeling of the hermit. It is the feeling which the garden artist tries to create when in a crowded country he wants to give you the sensation of being way off in a mountain landscape. So this sense you see of solitariness, of being able to wander off on your own, is Sabi and is a thing of course that any sane person has to have. One has to have privacy. You have to have a uh, space in which to be alone so as not to become a rubber stamp. Wherever you stand, everywhere is the mountain solitude, even in the middle of an uproar. This is Sabi. Supposing you are bothered by financial uproar, wars, politics and everything like that and you are sitting on a beach and you become aware of the water endlessly crossing pebbles and you get a sense that this goes on forever and ever and ever, it is long before you were thought of, long before all human history, empires, schemes and so on and will endure long after. But it's something that strikes you that is very simple, very ordinary, like the water on the pebbles, that suggests a kind of amazing eternal reliability of nature. That in the very humble form goes on and on and on, and uh, whatever human beings may do, this everlasting sanity persists. Now that strange flip from the mood of depression to the mood of a certain consolation in this weed is wabi. Nothing is more terrifying than the state of chronic anxiety which one has if you are subject to the illusion that something or other in life could be held onto and safeguarded and nothing can. So the acceptance of uh, everything flowing away is absolutely basic to freedom, to being unsui, a cloud water person who drifts like cloud and flows like water. But in this, we mustn't take ourselves too ridiculously. I mean, naturally all human beings have in them a certain clinging. See, you can't let go totally. You wouldn't be human if you did. You can't be just a leaf on the wind or just a ball in a mountain stream, to use a Zen poetic phrase. 
because if you were that you wouldn't be human just as I pointed out that a person with no emotions who has completely controlled his emotions is a stone Buddha so a person who would be completely let go would also be some kind of an inanimate object so Zen very definitely emphasizes being human being perfectly human as its ideal and so to be perfectly human one must have not a state of absolute detachment but a state of detachment which contains a little bit of resistance a certain clinging still Everything is change and nothing at all can be held on to or possessed. Here is a man fishing and uh, he's sitting in the evening in the twilight on the edge of a river with his fishing rod in a lonely little boat tied up by the bank. Now if this man is fishing with his mind intent simply on catching fish, this is not for you. But if he's also digging the atmosphere it's for you. To flow with the wind, you see, to dig the atmosphere. American offers the most beautiful possibilities of translation in our incomparable slang for some oriental ideas. For you is to get with it, to flow with it. And uh, not again, you see, in the sense of the merely passive leaf flowing on the wind. But Furyu has in it, you see, a touch of self-consciousness, like that man fishing. Now, you would think if you studied Taoist philosophy that this would be very bad. Uh, Zhuangzi somewhere says that a comfortable belt is one that you don't feel, and you're unaware of it. That's not the most comfortable belt like comfortable shoes would you be completely unconscious of comfortable shoes no something better than comfortable shoes are shoes that you know are comfortable so in the same way self-consciousness adds something to life it's one thing to be happy and not know it it's another thing to be happy and to know it There is something about being human, about being self-conscious, that is not a mistake of nature, not 
a completely evil fall into self-awareness. But self-awareness, although it creates all kinds of problems, because through self-awareness, the human being is in some sense a self-frustrating mechanism. He knows that he's going to die. And the price of being able to control the future is to know that in the long run you won't be able to and worry about that. But also, with self-consciousness goes the possibility of resonance, of realization, of becoming enlightened, liberated, and knowing it, and therefore able to enjoy it. And everybody has in their back of their minds an image of the place that you want to go to. Or some, not really an image though, it's, it's always slightly indefinite. There's the certain feeling of, <clears throat> there ought to be somewhere the thing I've always wanted. We get disappointed, of course, because as we get older we feel that perhaps that doesn't exist at all. That one just has to put up with the second best or with something. Half a loaf is better than no bread. All these things are, are symbols. On one level, they're very human, and they reflect our perhaps childish and immature desires to be really alone, to have that paradise thing. And realistic people say, well, you ought not to bother yourself or fool yourself with such fantasies. And nowadays I find that we feel very guilty about uh, thinking of paradise, of horizon or whatever it is, the enchanted garden. We think, no, -uh. reality is what you read about in the newspapers and you've got to face it. And everything is unpleasant, basically. I know there's the hard-boiled school of uh, zoologists, for example, who insist that birds hate flying. You know, everybody has always envied a bird and wanted to be able to glide along with wings, you know. And so there comes up somebody, who's usually some wretched academician, who says, no, <coughs> we've discovered by measurements that birds loathe flying. I must feel very satisfactory when you found that out because you've smashed an ideal. Oh, for the wings of a dove. <laughs> Far away would I roam the wilderness build me a nest and remain there forever at rest. I'm quoting these psalms. But uh, <laughs> apparently doves just hate this chore of flying. <laughs> now, uh, it is just in the same way as uh, it's ridiculous to try to be so inhuman as never to feel any regrets about the passing of time and of life and uh, so on. It's likewise inhuman not to have the paradise fantasy of the mysterious place round the corner, just over the crest of the hill, just behind the island in the distance. You see? Because that place is really uh, the big joke. That's you. That's why you have found that at the end of the line, when you get through the last story and up the last stairway, you are liable to be confronted with a mirror. 
and so uh, everybody is seeking, 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 seeking for that thing that you've got to have, you see. Well, you've got it. And, but nobody's going to believe this. But there it is, the, the, real, the real thing that you are is the paradise land that you're looking for at the end of the line. And it's far, far more uh, reliable than any kind of an external scene which you could love and cling to and hold on to. Of course, the whole fascination of life is that that seems perfectly incredible. <laughs>